This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. The people of Israel have faced now the Red Sea. God, with a great east wind, has opened it up, and there's a path through the Red Sea, water congealed on either side, a dry land through which they can walk to get to the other side. Now, the people of Egypt, the army, the horses, the chariots are behind them. God has blocked them with a cloud, but after the the Israelites get far enough, then the cloud goes away. The Egyptians pursue them. Their idea was that if the Israelites can do it, surely we can do it too. And now the Israelites up on the other side and the Egyptians pursue them. When they get down to the middle of it, God takes the the chariot wheels off. It's time for God's wrath to be poured onto the Egyptians. They are stuck in the middle. And the The walls of water are released and they come crashing down. And in just just a moment of time, they're all destroyed. They all are destroyed. Now, this is perhaps the Gulf of Aquaba and the coast of Nuaba. It's a beach for the Israelite crossing. Ron Wyatt, who passed away in 1999 and his divers discovered that while there are deep canyons under the water along this point, massive canyons, there is a wide level place right here off this beach, an underwater land bridge if you please. Now the water's clearly deep enough to drown the Egyptians, but it's a place free from lots of debris where people could have actually walked across. Divers have found what appear to be coral-encrusted chariot wheels, similar to the early drawings of Egyptian wheels. It was, it was the doing of God. Stretch your hand over the sea that the waters may come back. And he over, overthrew the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed the Lord. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. On the other side, they sing a song crediting God for all of it. They they called it the Song of Moses. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. I want you to savor this moment for the devotion of God that they have right now isn't going to last. Incidentally, the Bible says that, that one day when this old world is gone, those who have been faithful to Christ will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, the song of victory. At this moment, the Israelites are wholly grateful and dedicated to following Jehovah anywhere and forever. But sadly for Moses and for his Israel, this moment is the best it ever gets. This is the best it ever gets with this group of former slaves. Now, they proceed forward. They're headed toward the promised land. Moses' leadership is tied to God, and we've got to communicate that to the Israelite people. They are used to being slaves. He's got to, God's got to connect them to him and to Moses as the leader. So there's an attack on the Israelites by Amalek. Amalek comes along and just attacks Israel in Rephidim. And the way that this worked was, uh, Israel started fighting against them. So you've got this battle going on. When Moses' hands are raised, his arms are raised, Israel is victorious. They're winning. When Moses' hands drop, well, Amalek starts winning. And so Aaron and a man named Hur come and get a seat for Moses, and he sits down, and they hold up on their shoulders. They hold up his arms, and Israel is victorious. Now the mountain. It's been three months since leaving Egypt, three months. This massive group of people is on a trek toward the promised land. They come to Mount Sinai. There are going to be three times that Moses is going to go up on this mountain, and you got to get this. It's time for God to shape the Israelites into a nation. Now, understand that that's hard to do. 
Hundreds of years they've been slaves. Freedom is what they want. And now they're released and they're just singing the song of freedom. They're breathing the air of freedom. But the problem is that freedom has to have order combined with it or it's no good. Liberalism always messes this up because liberalism believes that the essence of freedom is no rules. Freedom is when we have no rules, no laws. But that's not freedom. Imagine a a football game. And you'll say, today we're going to play football, but we're not going to have any rules. How long do you suppose the game's going to last? How long would it be fun? It wouldn't be fun. You can only play the game if there are rules. The first thing God's going to do is to give Israel a law. Now, Moses goes up on, on Mount Sinai the first time. He's going to establish where they are. God verbally tells the commands to Moses. Moses writes them down. The Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, You'll say to the house of Jacob, Tell the children of Israel, You saw what I did to the Egyptians. I bore you on eagles' wings. I brought you unto myself. Now, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you'll be a a particular, peculiar treasure to me above all the people. I love this part. He said, Because the earth is mine. Not, Not the God's polytheistic idea of the Egyptians. The earth is mine. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you'll speak unto the children of Israel. He's got to get inside of them. After warning the people not to come on the mountain, God audibly speaks the Ten Commandments. He gives Moses many other commandments for Israel. Moses writes them down. Now, here's the second time up the mountain. This time it's going to be for 40 days and 40 nights. God produces the Tables of stone, he's going to write on them with his own hands. There will be the instruction of the building of the tabernacle and the altar, the furniture, the Ark of the Covenant, the priest's garments, sacrifices and taxes. It took a long time. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communicating with him upon Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. We're going to call them later the handwriting of ordinances. And then there's this this moment, and God says, Moses, go back down. They've corrupted themselves. When Moses gets to where Joshua was, somewhere in the mountain, on the mountain there, Joshua says, do you hear it, Moses? There's a sound of war in the camp. Moses says, that's not the sound of victory or defeat. That's the sound of singing. And he, he comes into sight, and he sees them. And they have created a golden calf. And he throws the table of stones down. He he breaks them out of frustration. The golden calf is the worst possible insult that the people of Israel could have given to God. There's never been blasphemy uttered that is worse than this. The Egyptians, I mean these Israelites, they're Egyptians in Israelite clothing. And Moses walks up to Aaron. Aaron, what, what do you mean? What are you doing here? Why did you do this? Now stop for a moment. It's amazing how different these two brothers can be. It's interesting that Aaron grew up in the stress of slavery and Moses grew up in the privileged life of the palace. You might have assumed that Aaron would be more apt to obey God, but it isn't that way. Furthermore, if Aaron wouldn't do the right thing for God while Moses is on the mountain, why didn't he respect his younger brother more? Why wouldn't he do it for Moses? Moses must have have dreaded facing God now. I'll tell you something, archaeologists are never going to find that golden calf because Moses ground it up into powder and he put it in their water to drink. And then he said, who's on the Lord's side? And you could tell that, that some, they, they, weren't, they weren't going along with this. They weren't going along with Jehovah God. Strap on your swords, he said. And, and he commanded the righteous to slay the unrighteous and 3,000 fell. Now, one of the keys to great leadership that you must get is that truth always trumps numbers. If a leader forgets that, if, if he forgets it, then the reason for which they exist goes away and he's really, he's really leading nothing. The third time up the mountain, it's, it's the next day, and he begins to plead with God, oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a, a God of gold. Yet now, if you'll forgive their sin, but, but if not, just just... Blot me out of your book, which you've written. (laughs) A great leader loves his people. He's got skin in the game. But God's response to this 
to Moses is, Moses, I keep the books. Moses brings his own stone this time, and God writes the commands again, and he speaks them to Moses. And Moses' face shines because he's been talking to God. Since the burning bush, his life has been different from any other man, living or dead. He's talked face to face with God. And people were afraid of Moses that day because his face was shining. And he put a veil over his face. And he continued this practice whenever he would be um, in the presence of God. Now I want you to see Moses in the kind of man he was. Now look, great leaders sometimes are misunderstood to be some sort of superhuman people, but that, that's not really true. Moses was just a man. There were three major challenges in Moses' leadership. The first one was family ties with Miriam and Aaron. Now, they're brother and sister to Moses, but they didn't grow up together. I mean, they were slaves. Miriam and Aaron grew up as slaves. Not Moses. He wore the purple velvet of royalty. Was there sibling rivalry? Was there jealousy? Were there times in Jochebed's house, Moses' mother's house, when Miriam maybe expressed rage at her circumstance and at Prince Moses for not doing more to help them? And now, Moses is the lawgiver of God. Well, Moses had married an Ethiopian woman, a Cushite woman. God had prohibited some marriages, some people the Israelites couldn't marry. But it wasn't because of nationality or color, it was because of it was because of ideology. And Mo Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. They were critical. You can, and Miriam led it. And, and, and some of this, I think, of the history, this, this angst about how we grew up and now you're privileged and you've always been privileged. You've always had more. Than, maybe this is coming out in Miriam. It wasn't God who criticized Moses about marrying the Cushite woman. Well, it was Miriam, his sister. And Aaron went along with it. And God clearly unhappy about this, calls them together, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses, and said, Now listen, if there's a prophet among you, I make myself known to him in a vision. But it's not so with Moses. He's faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And suddenly Miriam has leprosy. She's eaten up with it. And Moses begs for Miriam to be free from her leprosy. And God said, for she's going to suffer this for a week, and then I'll take it away. That was the first major challenge to Moses as a man. I would say the second one is, is what happened with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, people of Israel, men of Israel, men, men who are well known in Israel. Sometimes opposition to God's way is fortified with numbers. They had 250 leaders of the congregation come They'd been, I think they'd been having meetings and they'd worked out their strategy and they gather together against Moses and Aaron and they say to them, you take too much upon yourselves for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the, the assembly of the Lord? So they challenge him. When Moses heard it, he fell on his face. Now you listen to me. God's Word is right no matter how many people oppose it. They're organized. They want Him to feel. Why did they bring 250 with Him? I think they wanted Moses to feel overwhelmed so he will resign his post. Now here's the argument. The argument is, Moses, you, you've made a power grab, and we're calling you on it. And then there's this implied assumption that, that the reason a man would be leader in Israel is because he is a holy man. Well, all of us are holy, Moses. You can't deny that, so you don't have any credentials better than ours. We should be leaders. And then they said, you exalt yourself. It's an, it's an implied assertion that he is narcissistic. You know, Greek mythology and Narcissus would look in the water and he saw his image and he thought he was so beautiful that finally he, I mean, he just stared at himself till he died. That, that you think too much of yourself. You've put yourself in this position as leader of Israel, but we think we should be the leaders. It's, it's an attempt at a coup. Of course, the difference between Moses and these people is that God had appointed Moses. He wasn't running for political office. When Moses hears their assertions, he falls on his face. Why do you think he did that? Maybe it was depression, but I expect he was not sure what, what God was going to do right then. Moses creates a public test. They're going to offer worship to God, and God will choose, publicly choose. Truth makes Moses unafraid. The 250 that follow Korah, 
They bring their censers and their incense, and God lashes out at them and kills all 250. And then he says, Moses, stand back from Korah, Dathan, and Abiram from their tents. And the earth begins to quake, and it opens up, and it swallows Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and that which appertains to them. And then it closes back up, and you can imagine how it must have sounded when it was all over and it got quiet. How do you think the people of Israel felt? Well, this is going to surprise you. The next day, the people of Israel began to cry out against Moses, and they said, You have killed the people of the Lord. Moses knows what's about to happen, and he looks up, and, and there's a cloud coming. And, and as it overcomes the people, the people beneath it begin to die. It's, it's a plague. And Moses says to Aaron, Quick, get, get your censer and offer intercession for the people. And, and so he does that. And Moses, the Bible says, there's this line of demarcation between those who are dead, dying, and those who are alive. But it's moving throughout the people. And Moses stands between the living and the dead. Those who died in that plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the Korah incident, and the plague stopped. It was the second major challenge. And the third major challenge in the leadership of Moses was the day Moses looked like a failure, I think, in people's eyes. He sent 12 spies to Canaan land. Israel suggested it. Why don't we send spies, one from each tribe, and they, they can figure out the way that we should go up into the land of Canaan. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran. And they viewed this as a, a test of Canaan. We'll go check it out. But it was actually a test of them. There was only one thing, they, right thing they could come back and say. And that is, we can do this if God is with us. They were gone for 40 days. The conclusion they arrived at was, we, uh, we don't need to do this. We, we, we don't need to go over into the land of... Uh, see, they're, they're soldiers. They have these fortified cities, and they're massive, and they're powerful. We go over there, and we, we're like grasshoppers. I mean, it's a beautiful place and all that, but we don't need to be doing this. And of course, what that means is that they completely ignored the power of God. God had just delivered them from Egyptian bondage with these massive plagues the miraculous plagues, and Moses with the mighty hand of God has done all of these things before them. And now they forgot all of that as if they're fighting these battles all by themselves and they're not going to go into the land of Canaan. So it turned into a coup against Moses. I mean, all the congregation, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, they lift up their voice and they cry, and the people wept all night. And the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the, the congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. If only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us up to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. And all the congregation said to stone them, Moses and Aaron, with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. And he said to Moses, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I'll make of you a nation greater and mightier than they, because these men who have seen my glory, they've seen the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, they've put me to this test these ten times. They haven't heeded my voice. They certainly shall not come to see the land. The bottom line is God can't use this generation. So he decrees that those who are 20 years old and above will never see Canaan. Those who are 19 years old and beneath will be the new generation who will go into the Canaan land, a generation presumably with more faith. Now, the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned, you know, and they made all the congregation complain against Moses and Aaron, they died right then by the plague before the Lord. Moses is a great leader, but he's just a man. There were three times Moses seems in his life to crumble under the pressure. Sometimes people who aren't leaders envy those who are. You know, you go into the office of a CEO and he's not there, and you might sit at the desk and say, I'd love this life. You know, I would enjoy having a desk secretary at a desk like this in a room. It'd be wonderful. But you know, he doesn't view it like that. He views it as work. Moses found times when he just nearly broke. Early on, Jethro, his father-in-law, 
came and observed what Moses was doing. He was judging the people and their, their problems, their quarrels. And they would line up long lines during the day, early morning till late at night. And he would listen. They would have been slaves. They were slaves. They, they didn't have the wisdom to discern between right and wrong and problem solving. And Moses would listen to them. I don't know if he took breaks to go to the restroom. Did he take breaks to eat lunch? They were lined up to talk to him, to have him settle their issues. Well, Jethro, his father-in-law, watches this and he says, look, what you're doing is not good. You're going to wear away. I mean, a counselor puts so much of himself or herself into the problems when you try to help people. And, and, and if you're not careful, you can end up doing too many things, yet none of them very well. Jethro said, Moses, I want you, I want you to provide of all the people, able men, good men, find good men, ones that fear God, men of truth, men who hate covetousness, and place such over the people so that they could be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it'll be that every great matter that they bring to you, but the every, every small matter, little stuff, they'll they'll bring to these other fellows. And so you won't have all this burden. Moses would face only the most difficult problems. People would have to go through four layers before they ever got to, to the big leader, Moses. It was to preserve him. Now, here's the second one. It's a crisis moment. The people had complained. They angered the Lord. He sent fire from heaven and burned them consumed a number of them out in the outskirts of the camp. And Moses prayed to the Lord and the fire was quenched. And so the punishment was exerted and now it stopped. But Moses has no time to get over that before more, more of the people come and they cry out to him. They want finer cuisine. Uh, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish. They're, they're dreaming of how wonderful it was back when they were in Egypt. We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, and the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Now manna was like coriander seed. It was brown in color, and the, and the people, you remember, would gather it, and, and they would grind it on millstones or beat it in the mortar. Or they would cook it in pans. They'd make cakes out of it. Its taste was like the taste of... Uh, a pastry prepared with oil. And every morning, except the Sabbath, it was there for them. Mo Mo Manna was a gift from God. It was like rain is for, for, from us, or for us today. I, I never complain about the rain because we can't live without it. Well, they couldn't live without the manna. It was a gift from God. It was necessary for life. They, they wanted a, a broader menu. And now they talked about how much they, had lo they loved Egyptian food. And Moses just... Moses just breaks down. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, and he, he kind of had to come apart. He, God, did I conceive all these people? I mean, did I beget them that, that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child? And Moses, uh, God's response to Moses was, look, I mean, God was patient. God, God said, deputize 70 elders to help you with this matter. God didn't upbraid him or shame him or punish him. He just understood that, that Moses was under a tremendous amount of pressure. He's just a man. And God then blesses him with some help in this matter. The third one and the final time that you see Moses facing crisis and breaking down, and this one's the game changer, is at Kadesh. Miriam, his sister, dies and Aaron's going to die soon hereafter. This generation that Moses has brought to this point is not going to be entering Canaan. Moses surely feels deflated. I mean, you can't not imagine him feeling somewhat like a failure. God says, the people want water. I want you to speak to the rock and I'll, I'll bring the water. So Moses shouts at the people, here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifts his hand and he strikes the rock twice. Now, two things are messed up. He disobeyed and he, and he struck the rock. That's not what God told him to do. And the second thing is he took some of the glory that belongs to God 
He was upset. He was frustrated. But he did it before people. The people saw this. And God simply had to communicate with this younger generation that Israelites have to follow God's will. The principles of strict obedience have to be followed. God would bless them when they did right, but He would punish them when they, they rebelled against Him and they sinned. First, how better to do that than with their leader Moses to make him an object lesson? And second, what message would God be sending if Moses gets a pass on disobedience? And God says, because you didn't believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, you're not going to bring this assembly into the Canaan land. There's no, I mean, this, this is punishment from God. There's no question about that because he said, go up to this mountain, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab across from Jericho, and I'll let you view the land of Canaan, which I gave to the children of Israel as a possession. Die on the mountain which you ascend and be gathered to your people, just like Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor, because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh. You didn't hallow me in the midst of the children of Israel, so you're not going to get to go to the land of Canaan. You'll be able to see it, but I won't let you go over. Moses... Death happens. The, uh, the necessary details were accomplished. Joshua was chosen for his successor. Joshua was a great man. There are many memories, successes, failures, tracking through the mind of Moses. I mean, he's filled the important role in Israel. So many times he saved their lives. He taught them, he fed them, he rebuked them. These 40 years in Midian as a shepherd and the 40 years in the palace have served him well. He stands there on the mountain gazing over Canaan, from Mount Nebo, it's a beautiful sight. He dreams of Israel going there. He's already said all his final goodbyes and he's warned the people about the necessity of obeying God. And Moses has no final words recorded. Maybe they were just too personal and God honored Moses by not revealing them. Think of the things Moses might have said. I want my sons to succeed me, you know. Or shouldn't there be a monument to my work? Or I just, I just don't think you're being fair, God. Couldn't you give me a year in the promised land? But, but, but there's none of that. There appears to be no apprehension, no dread, just resolve. He didn't run. God told him when to show up at Nebo to conclude his life on earth, and Moses uh, showed up on time. He's a weary leader. He physically feels he could still go on, but he accepts God's decision. I wonder what he'd have said if, as he reflected over his amazing 120 years, if you could just ask him, walk up to him and and ask him, Moses, did you enjoy being the leader of God's people, Israel? I think he'd have paused and looked a little perplexed and said, it wasn't about pleasure. It was about purpose. That's how great leadership is, I suppose. It's about purpose. Moses understood that true greatness and leadership is not in how many people you can get to serve you, but in how many people you can serve. Here's the news report about his death. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him in a valley of the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the grave to this day. Moses, 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dimmed, nor his natural vigor diminished. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. Yeah, you, you can call the death of Moses punishment, yet the punishment has to be in quotes. It isn't so tragic after all. When you get to Matthew chapter 17 of the New Testament, what you read about is Moses with Jesus and Elijah on that great mountain. And Moses is with the Son of God today. Punishment? Hmm. What God did was to say to this great epic leader of Moses, I think you've had enough. And God took Moses to heaven. And one day, if we live faithfully to our Lord, we're going to be with Moses in the land that is fairer than day. Would you call Moses' life a success? It depends on your definition. But I would say Moses, the great lawgiver of God, was very successful.